your truth. And so, God, we worship you today, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming to worship. Man, I can tell we're going to have a good time today. This is awesome. You guys are... Got some energy, man. It's it's like I can't imagine a better place to be than uh, than being together, being here with you all, celebrating the good news of Jesus, celebrating Easter Sunday morning that He is risen. All right, you can't say He is risen indeed. Too. Let's try again. He is risen. Man, this is beautiful. Such such good news and the power of those songs uh, we just saying, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Uh, I hope whether you came in this morning feeling free, uh, my prayer is that every one of us walks out of this place this morning feeling free, knowing that we are free in Christ because of what he has done for us. So, so good to be together. Um, what, are you guys like, are you okay if we go a little bit deeper than kind of surface level stuff this morning? Like I checked with our greeter, Sandy, and she said, you all look really, really smart, and so she thinks you can handle it. Um, But if we sort of like dive deep a little bit, as we start this morning a brand new series called Victory. The series is called Victory, and for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about the most important things people can talk about. The most important things we can actually consider, we are going to be spending our next three weeks looking at. And that's This question, what does it mean that Jesus gave his life on the cross and was raised from the dead? What does it mean? What are the implications of that? Over the next three weeks, starting today, what we're going to do is we're sort of going to picture ourselves walking around the cross. Because what can tend to happen with us if we've been around the church for any length of time, and by the way, if you've never been in a church before, like so glad you're here this morning. Uh, If you're a regular part of Journey, we're glad you're here too, or anywhere in between, that's great. And, um, but what can happen to us is the cross, we can kind of stand at one place and look at the cross, and from this one vantage point, we find beauty and meaning that transforms our lives, right? I mean, but what happens to us is we tend to stay at one spot and look at the cross through one vantage point. But as we turn and move around the cross, we see more and more beauty. The beauty of what God has done for us just gets fuller and and more transforming. And so over these next three weeks, we are going to be walking around the cross. And we're going to be looking at it from different angles uh, revealed to us through the scriptures. And uh, yeah, I'm super, super excited. If you can't tell, my throat, uh, hopefully I have one more service left in my, my throat here. So this morning... As we, as we come to the cross, as we come to like consider the cross, we have to start from the perspective that God is love. God is love. Would you say that with me? God is love. Wonderful. Um, this is the clear teaching of the scriptures. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. God is love. Love, this is God's essence, God's DNA. If you want to know what God is like, God is love. Through and through, inside and out, top to bottom, God is love. Everything God does is an expression of his love. Everything. Um, Any sort of act of God is always an expression of his love. This is his very essence, the core of who he is. God is love. Um, And here's the thing, that truth will set us free. Like, and maybe some of us, from whatever sort of influences, we 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 can kind of say, yeah, I, I I believe the scriptures say God is love, but it doesn't feel like God is very loving. Have you ever felt that way? Like I, you know, I I I can affirm God is love, but if I close my eyes and I picture God, would you do that for a second? Just close your eyes. And just get an image of God in your mind. Just picture, what is that? What is a picture of God you have in your mind? And if that picture of God you have in your mind doesn't look like Jesus giving his life away for human beings, for us, even while we were still sinners, then the image of God we have in our minds isn't right. 
If the image of God we have in our mind is anything less than love, then the image of God we have in our minds has to be transformed because it's not the true image of God. Jesus reveals God perfectly, and Jesus reveals that God is love. Um, and this truth will set us free. For example, I want to tell a story. Um, this is a story of uh, uh, Leah Fuquay. Uh, Brandon and Leah have been coming to Journey since uh, around Christmas time. And Aaliyah has just been really open to, to share a part of her story. And every week we try to share a story from the journey. And so I, I kind of wanted to incorporate this into the teaching. So this is Aaliyah's story. I chose to follow Jesus when I was a child. I felt God's leading always in my life. When my husband and, and I moved to Idaho, uh, I was so happy there that I thought God would want us to live there forever. You have to like listen to Aaliyah talk about this. She's like, you walk out and you would smell the mountains on a beautiful day. I don't know how many of you have walked outside today, but you can't quite smell the mountains from Kansas. Um, you can smell other things, uh, especially down by Yoder. Um, it's all good, but uh, it's all good. So just like loved living in this little town in the, you know, the base of the mountains in Idaho and just wanted to stay there, saw their lives playing out there forever. But that wasn't the case. She said, we moved back, back here to Kansas for my husband to further his career, and I became so angry and unforgivingly bitter. I began to think that God hated me, and eventually that God hated women. This lie just sort of took root in her mind that, man, God hates me. He must hate me, and, and God hates all women. This lie just began to grow and grow. After five years of this, we came to Journey to visit on a Sunday morning. And it was a Sunday morning during our Christmas season. It was a Sunday morning when we were talking about Jesus being the exact imprint of the Father. Jesus saying, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. There is no God behind the back of Jesus Christ. Jesus clearly reveals the Father. And they came on that Sunday... And she says, I didn't think that Jesus hated me. Like I knew Jesus loved me. And if Jesus loved me, then God must love me too. So we went forward after the service and I confessed. I spoke how twisted my view of God had become. And Eric prayed for us. And since then, our family has been on a journey of healing. I've learned a lot of selfish and angry habits over the last five years, but I'm trusting that because God loves me, it is possible to rebuild and learn to love others again too. Can we just like say thank you, God, for his transforming love? This truth, this truth, if you hear nothing else this morning, this truth that God is love. Would you, would you just open yourself to accept that? that? This is the beauty, the beauty of who God is, that as you look at the cross, what you are seeing is the end love is willing to go for us. You're seeing the embodiment of God, the embodiment of love given away for us. This is what 1 John chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 say. This is how God showed his love among us. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Uh, this is the, the, the beautiful extent to which love was willing to go for us, to give his life away, to take away our sins. Um, for example, like in the Gospel of John chapter 13, it's the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. And he has this last meal with his disciples, and the, the tone is heavy. Like the disciples, they all know Jesus has been talking. His, his life is coming to an end as they've known it. And so in this act of love, in fact, John chapter 13, verse 1 says, Having loved his own who were in the world, his friends, his disciples, he loved them to the very end, to the uttermost. And it says what, what he did after the meal was over, he took off his outer garment and he, he wrapped a towel around his waist. He took on this shameful position of a servant. He, he took on shame. And he stooped down and he went around the room to his disciples. And he took a basin of water and this towel wrapped around his waist. And he washed away the dirt and the grime of the day's walk from his disciples' feet. 
And John paints this picture. He says, this is symbolic of what Jesus was about to do the next night as he would on the cross wash away the dirt and the grime of centuries of human sin in his water and blood poured out on the cross. This is, this is love, the embodiment of love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, says he made an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, what does it mean that Jesus atoned for our sins? Now, the word atonement, it sounds like a big kind of impressive $30 word. It's not. It's more like a $2 word. Um, it, but it's really powerful. The word, it just means at one mint. At one mint. Um, atonement just means there, were so, there was something that was broken, that was separated into two, and he brought it back together. He made it one again. So Jesus, uh, John says, Jesus made an atoning sacrifice, made us one again with God through his death. But that begs the question, how did that work? How did he make us one? What did his death have to do with making us one with God again? The, the idea of atonement holds together all these questions. And maybe you're asking these questions, even on this Easter Sunday morning. Questions like, why did Jesus die? Like, why, what was the big deal? Why did he have to die? Couldn't he have just taught us? Uh, if Jesus just needed to shed his blood, why wasn't he killed as a child? Right? Why didn't Herod just kill him as a child? If it was just blood that needed to be shed. Who killed Jesus? Like, who, who was it that actually killed Jesus? What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? What difference does his death and resurrection actually make? These are questions that the idea of atonement actually hold together. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring them. One of the ways, the first perspective I want us to look at today is this perspective on the cross that says Christ is victorious. The title of the sermon is Christ is victorious. Um, and it's, it comes from this Latin phrase called Christus Victor. You want to say that? It's kind of a fun thing to say on a Sunday morning. Christus Victor. Um, and is this view of the cross, this vantage point on the, of the cross, was the dominant view of the death and resurrection of Jesus for the first thousand years of the church. If you were going to ask somebody in the first thousand years of the church, probably, hey, why did Jesus die? They would have probably told you, he died to be victorious over the powers of Satan, sin, and evil. If you would have asked uh, John, the, God, the disciple of Jesus, the one who, you know, he was a, he was a disciple of Jesus like love, he was a beloved, and he was sitting in that circle that day, the, the day Jesus washed the dirt off of his feet. He was with Jesus at the cross, watching along with Jesus' mother Mary, watching Jesus be crucified. If you had the chance to stand in front of John and say, John, why did Jesus come? Why did he die? John probably would have given you an answer like he wrote in 1 John 3, 8. The devil has been sinning since the very beginning. I think the words will be on the screen here. 1 John 3, chapter 8. The devil has been sinning since the very beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. Christ is victorious. The reason Jesus appeared, the reason he gave his life, the reason he rose from the dead, the way he atones for our sins is he destroyed the devil's works. Uh, Christ is victorious. See, the devil, well, let's, I, I want you to know that I'm not making this stuff up. So let's look at two other places in the New Testament. You don't have time to turn there, but you can write them down so you can go back to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 40, 54 to 56. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is victorious. Victorious over the powers of death and sin. Uh, take a look at Hebrews chapter 2. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. Who's the one who holds the power of death? That is the devil. And set those free whose lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Christ is victorious over whom? Over the devil, over Satan, over the principalities and powers of evil. If you were going to ask the, the disciple John, why did Jesus come? Why did he die? I think he would have given us this answer. To, to be victorious, to triumph over Satan and the principalities and powers of evil, including death itself. What does it mean 
Are you guys hanging in there? All right. This is, a view of, this is a view of the cross the church has kind of let go of for about the last 500 years. And it's so powerful. Not all the church. There's lots of the church that has held on to this view, but a lot of the church has missed it. And the evangelical church in the United States has kind of let go of some of this. That Christ is victorious over Satan and the principalities, powers of evil. So what does it mean when John says Satan has been sinning since the beginning? The devil has been sinning, uh, rebelling since the very beginning. Do you remember the story at the beginning of the Bible? You got the first human beings, Adam and Eve, and they're in the garden and they're in relationship with God. There's no at one needed because they are at one, right? I mean, they're at one with God. But Satan whose name actually means the accuser, ha-satan, the accuser. That's what Satan means. The accuser comes to these people in the form of a serpent. And what does the accuser do? He accuses God of not being as good as they really think. And so the serpent comes to these people and says, no, 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 there's a better way for you than the way God has arranged for you. And they believe the lie. They believe the lie that God is not good, that God is not completely love. And what happens is they take the fruit and they invite sin into their lives and into this world and all of creation is cursed because of it. This is how the scriptures begin. But in this whole story, in the first couple chapters of Genesis, God speaks the first words of the good news. God speaks the first words of what his plan is going to be to overcome now the powers of the accuser, of Satan. And in Genesis chapter 3, right here at the very beginning, in Genesis 3, God speaks to the serpent, the accuser, and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Do you hear the gospel in that? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works, to destroy the power of the accuser. You will strike his heel with all the venom you have, and he will crush your head. He will be victorious. He's looking forward, looking forward to the time when Jesus would come. We hear the gospel in Genesis chapter 3. And then this is is how the New Testament writers, they reflect back. They say Jesus is victorious over Satan, principalities of power. Take a look at Colossians. Um, Take a look at Colossians chapter 2, 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins, And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. While we were still dead in our sins, while we were still under the curse of the enemy, God came and made us alive. And he forgave all of our sins, and he has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. Like, is that good news? If we were a Pentecostal church, like somebody would have said amen or hallelujah or something right there. Like, he has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. This this debt of sin, this curse that we brought onto ourselves, he has canceled. How did he do it? It stood against us and it condemned us. It filled us with shame. And he has taken it away because it has been nailed to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. Who did Jesus defeat on the cross but Satan and the principalities and powers of accusation and blame and sin and violence and death? He triumphed over them on the cross. This is is the good news of Jesus, the good news. God is not your accuser. This has been the lie since the very beginning that God is the one who's pointing the finger at you, accusing you of your sin, and just like waiting to punish you. God is not your accuser. Satan is the accuser. Would you agree with me that God is the opposite of Satan? If Satan is darkness, God is... If Satan is the accuser, God is our advocate. God is the one who comes and who takes the charge of our legal indebtedness. And he comes and he takes it onto himself, into his own body, so that he can cancel the weight of that sin. Um, The New Testament talks about Satan, the accuser, in ways that we maybe not be comfortable with. Did you, you probably didn't come on Easter Sunday. Sorry, like, the cross is the symbol of the early church. It's a symbol of the Christian faith, the cross is. Like, Aside from popular belief, it's not the Easter Bunny. Um, and so like, I realized, like, I didn't come on Easter Sunday like, wanting to talk about the Satan and the devil and all that stuff. Um, so thanks for hanging in there. But this is core to the message of Jesus. 
The New Testament talks about Satan, the accuser, in ways we might not be comfortable with. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 calls him the God of this age. The accuser is the God of this age. And he has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Who is the image of God? It's Jesus. Right? He is, he is the glory of God. He is the image of God. And Satan, the accuser, blinds us so that we can't see the goodness of God's glory in him. Maybe some of us are blinded by that today. 1 John 5, verse 19 says, The whole world is under the curse of the evil one. The whole world has been under the curse of the evil one. How does that work? Do you know that ever since the very beginning, this world has run on accusation and blame? What happens the moment these two people take the fruit and eat it? But whose fault was it? It was her fault. She had this woman you put here with me. It was her fault. It was the serpent's fault. They just start blaming each other. What is this accusation? You just start accusing other people. Whose fault is it that the world is broken? Insert your, um, insert the political party you're not a part of here. Who's, whose fault is it? It's them. If they could just straighten up and see things my way, the whole world would be better. Whose fault is it the world is broken? It's that people group on the other side of the planet. It's, that, it's those people who sin differently than I do. They're the problem with the world. And we just accuse and blame and point fingers and we are playing into Satan's hand. This is who he is. It is he is the accuser. And so the whole world has functioned this way where we take our Cain and Abel, this very next story in Genesis 4, we, we take our brother and we accuse him. And we're threatened by him and we turn him into our enemy and then we do violence to him and the end result is what? It's death. It's what the enemy does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy accusation, turning a brother into an enemy, violence, and death. But Jesus has come to set us free from all of that. Maybe a story will help. Uh, how many of you are fans of C.S. Lewis? Have you heard of C.S. Lewis? Probably, in my opinion, the greatest Christian thinker of the 20th century. Absolutely brilliant. And sometimes, we just finished a series called uh, Vertigo, The Disorienting Stories of Jesus. And Jesus told lots of stories. And C.S. Lewis was a phenomenal storyteller. And he told these stories called The, Chron the Chronicles of Narnia. Have any of you read those or watched the movie, movies? Um, he wrote these in 1950 in, in, in World War II England. And the first of The Chronicles of Narnia is a story called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And, and this story, it, it's, it's Lewis's way of telling a story that gets us inside this Christ is victorious view of the cross. And he tells a story about four um, Pavensi children, four children who make their way, wander into a wardrobe, and as they get inside this wardrobe, this whole new world opens up to them called Narnia, this fantastic world of like talking animals and just beautiful, beautiful stuff. But what they find is that ruling Narnia, the, 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 the one who's in charge of Narnia at this point, is the white witch. It's, it's, it's Lewis's Satan figure, the accuser. This white witch has been ruling Narnia. And her rule has been horrible, uh, has brought endless winter. And everyone who has resisted her has turned into a statue. Now, one of these Pevensey children, uh, his name's Edmund. He's kind of the sniveling little brat of the... The group, um, sorry if any of you are like really big Edmund fans. Um, but so Edmund, he is drawn to the witch because she promises him his favorite dessert, which is Turkish delight. Um, and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I've got this. And, and he takes it and he's drawn to her and he eats it. And he eats more and more and more. And what he discovers is the more he eats, the less satisfied he is. How many of you have been down that road, right? I mean, there's this temptation, this, ah, oh, like this is what's going to fulfill me. But the more we have, the more we want, the more we desire. And he actually eats so much he gets sick. She's promised him that he can become a prince. But after sort of being drawn to her, after taking her temptation, after becoming a traitor, he realizes that she is actually really cruel. That her rule is not what, it, what he was promised, but he is miserable. He's miserable. Now, her goal for, these, for Edmund was to use him as a, as a way of trapping the other children, the other three children, so she could kill them all because they were destined to become royalty and she wanted to keep them from that. 
So in the middle of this, the Christ figure comes in. The lion, Aslan. I can't say it in the British accent, right? Aslan. Um, There's Liam Neeson in the movie, which you got to love. Um, so Aslan, lion, the lion, comes in. And the moment, this is the Christ figure, right? The moment Aslan comes in on the scene, everything starts changing. Winter starts thawing. People start coming alive for the very first time, or these animals, they start coming alive and tasting joy for the very first time. So the queen, the wicked witch, the, the white witch, she, I'm getting my stories confused, that was totally Oz, that was a world of Oz. The, the white witch, she decides, rather than trying to trap, because of Aslan, rather than trying to trap the other kids, she's just going to kill Edmund. And so she has him, she's ready to, to, to kill him, and um, some, some animals who are loyal to Aslan come and take Edmund away and bring him back to Aslan. And here Edmund, this traitor, is reconciled to his brothers and sisters. He's reconciled to Aslan. And it looks like the story is going to go well. But in comes the accuser. And she comes to Aslan and she protests that Edmund is a traitor. And according to the law, what, what Lewis in the story calls the deep magic, all traitors belong to her. And you know what? Aslan doesn't refuse her. Aslan doesn't say, you're wrong. He says, all, all traitors belong to her. They're under her authority. And she has a right to kill Edmund. But Aslan pulls her aside and talks to her privately. And what we find out later is that he agrees to die in Edmund's place. And she agrees. So, Later that evening, the two sisters are walking Aslan through the forest, and they come to the place where the, the white witch has prepared this place where Aslan will die. And Aslan walks toward them willingly, just walks toward his death. And beasts that are loyal to the accuser, they come and they bind him, and they beat him, and they mock him, and they muzzle him, and they shave his mane, and they drag his heavy body up onto the stone table. And these are the words of C.S. Lewis. The witch bared her arms as she had bared them the previous night when it had been Esmond, uh, Edmund instead of Aslan. And she began to whet her knife. And it looked at the children when the gleam of the torchlight fell on it as if the knife were made of stone, not of steel. And it was a strange, evil object. At last she drew near and she stood by Aslan's head. Her face was working and twitching with passion. But his looked up at the sky, still quiet, neither angry nor afraid, but a little sad. Then, just before she gave the blow, she stooped down and said in a quivering voice, And now who has won? Fool, did you think that by all this you could save the human traitor? Now I will kill you instead of him as our pact was so the deep magic will be appeased. But when you are dead, what will prevent me from killing him as well? And who will take him out of my hand then? Understand that you have given me Narnia forever and you have lost your own life and you have not saved his. In this knowledge, despair and die. The children did not see the actual moment of the killing. They couldn't bear to look. They had covered their eyes. While the two girls, still crouched in the bushes, covered their faces with their hands, they heard the voice of the witch calling out, Now, follow me all, and we will set about what remains of this war. It will not take long to crush the human vermin and the traitors, now that this great fool, the great cat, is dead. The girls eventually make their way out of the bushes to where Aslan lay dead on the stone table. And they come close to him and they end up falling asleep and spending the night around his lifeless body. And this is what happens next. We should go.
Saslan. What have they done? interpreted the deep magic differently. That when a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack, and even death itself would turn backwards. We sent the news that you were dead. Peter and Edmund will have gone to war. We have to help them. We will, dear one, but not alone. Climb on my back. We have far to go, and little time to get there. You may want to cover your ears. Christ is risen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, Paul says this, We speak this message of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of this age, of the rulers of this age, Wisdom of accusation and blame, turning people into enemies. These are coming to nothing. We declare the greater wisdom, God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden in God and destined for our glory since before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The rulers, the principalities and powers, the accuser did not understand the power of God's sacrificial love could not understand the power of God's sacrificial love. And so they perpetuated the act, the act of nailing the sinless Lamb of God onto the cross, which was the very act that disarmed their power to accuse and condemn that Jesus, the gospel, is this good news that all of evil was gathered in one place and has done its very worst to destroy the embodiment of love and goodness and grace, the embodiment of God. John says that Jesus was like a light that shone in the darkness. And as he came into the world, he began to thaw this frozen world. During his ministry, he was like a magnet that drew the powers of evil to himself from the shrieking demons that came out of those he healed to the accusation and the threats of the religious and political leaders who nailed him to the cross. He drew it into himself like perfect light. He exposed its diabolical ugliness. Jesus went into the heart of darkness and took upon himself the full brunt of Satan's fury. And he gave himself over to one of the most fearsome tools that the accuser had plagued humanity with since the very beginning of the world, the tools of violence and death. And all the power of all the fallen world to inflict suffering was directed onto Jesus, whom God the Father had sent into the world to set us free from our slavery to sin and death and Satan. And Satan struck his heel with all the venom he had. And Jesus took it all. He took all the venom of hate and violence and sin and accusation into his own perfect flesh and he absorbed it all on the cross. What we see is the power to harm clashing with the power to heal, the power of this fallen world with the power of God, the power to control and dominate and threaten to the power to humbly stoop and sacrifice and love. And do you know who won? Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Would you say this with me? Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Satan has no more venom. If we were a Pentecostal church, somebody would have said hallelujah, right? (laughs) Satan has no more venom. The charge of our legal indebtedness is gone. Where did it go? It was nailed to the tree. It was all there in his perfect, perfect body. So if you are in Christ, if you have surrendered your life to the good news that God has acted on your behalf, brothers and sisters, there is no more accusation. 
Satan is, is, is sinful, as fallen, as flawed as we are. Satan has no ammunition because it has been taken away from him. So you can speak to the accuser and you can say, you've got nothing on me, right? Because all of my sin, all of that finger pointing, all that accusation was nailed to the cross and it can't touch me anymore. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. If you are in Christ, you are free indeed. I, I imagine that morning of resurrection, like we picture this quiet morning where like there are lilies blooming in the garden and the women come to the tomb and the stone is rolled away and it's kind of quiet like angelic harps playing. I imagine like this noisy clanging of chains that have bound people for thousands of years falling to the ground in this clash of metal because Jesus has set the captives free. If you are in Christ, you are free indeed. You're free indeed. This is good news, right? Anybody? Am I just sweating up here for nothing? Man. And, and I, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you're not in Christ, if you've never heard this message of God's love, and you have an image of God in your mind that God is not love, and you've never heard a message that God has actually given his own life for you, and all you have to do is just simply receive it, that he took your shame away, the shame of, here's the deal, we're all Edmund. Like, we're all Edmund. We're all sort of gone this way of being a traitor, and Jesus took our shame, and he took it away. If you're here this morning, and that's you, and you're still carrying around the accusation of your sin because Christ has not set you free, would you receive the gift of his grace today? Would you, would you receive the gift of his forgiveness, of his love? Would you believe that he actually died to take away your sins, and would you leave this place free indeed? This is the invitation of the gospel this morning. God wants to share his victory with us. He wants to share it. He wants to fill us with his love so that we can go out into the world and we can share his victory in the dark places of this world. This is the good news of Easter Sunday morning. God, we ask that you would fill us with all the mystery, all the beauty, all of the, just the amazing truth God, that you are love and that you have set us free from the hold the accuser, the Satan, has had on us. And God, this world still has darkness, still has pain, still has brokenness. And God, you've called us, those who are standing in your victory, to move out into this world and to share this victory, to share this good news. God, we trust that you are making all things new. God, if there's any of us here who have never surrendered to you. God, I, I just believe that your spirit is moving in our hearts. And your spirit is it's just making your love for us known and felt. 